Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Hello, I'm Shahida Bari. I'm one of the fellows of the Forum, and I'm your chair tonight. Um, this event is titled The Age of the Algorithm. Um, I'm going to preface our conversation um, with a quick note about, well, thank you for coming in this inclement weather, but also um, through the strike. So, um, as you know, um, the University and Colleges Union is engaged in industrial action, and the forum, many members of the forum, uh, Beth included, and myself, are academics. Um, and uh, we're currently striking. I'm currently on strike <laughs> at uh, my institution, which is Queen Mary University of London. As you know, we're, uh, we're striking over pensions. Um, but I thought it was worth noting that. Um, we decided to, to run this event today after some consideration because um, those of you who come regularly know that the forum events are part of a program um, of public, under, uh, um, public engagement that we do. And um, the forum is a charity that is independent of institutional and certainly academic support financially or other. Um, so it's important for us to run the event. And for that reason, we consider our event exempt from the industrial action. But it, I would like to take this opportunity, and I'm sure the panelists would agree that we, that we want to signal our support of the UCU and the strike at the moment. So we just let's do it on a preparatory note festival. But today's event is about algorithms, the machines that are going to be, going to be taking over our jobs probably. Um, hands up if any of you are on Tinder, Bumble or Grindr. Hmm, all of you. <laughs> um, the ubiquity of dating apps is just one indication of the ways in which we entrust our lives to algorithmic calculations from the targeted marketing of political campaigns to the predictive hyping that preempts your Google searches. Machines seem to know us better than we know ourselves. At the same time, we seem to be plagued by anxieties about the way algorithms manipulate and perhaps even endanger our free will. Now these are philosophical questions as well as the concerns of our modern life, hence our debate today. So <coughs> joining us to discuss are Abebe Berhani, a postgraduate researcher in cognitive science at University College Dublin. She blogs regularly about <coughs> embodied cognition and the inactive approach to cognitive science on her website, which has this very charming tagline, anti-Cartesian rants, comma, mainly. Um, <coughs> Neil Lawrence is a professor at the University of Sheffield. He's currently on leave and working instead at Amazon. He's um, issued a disclaimer that he's not responsible for any of your late deliveries, so please don't <laughs> ask him about it, but he is the director of machine learning there. And he's also the founder of Amazon Research Cambridge, and he also has a blog, inverseprobability.com. You don't have a tagline, but you do have some charming photos of your son and mother planting seeds, and I think that might be an analogy that we've we'll come to at some point. And then lastly, not leastly, Martin Robbins. Martin is head of product at Fact Marta, which is an organisation committed to building a better media ecosystem. He's also the author of Raising Hal, a blog about AI, and he's written about data and tech for The Guardian, Vice, and Little Atoms. And in fact, if any of you followed Vice's big expose of the data crunches Cambridge Analytica last year and their apparent role in the US election, you might also have read Martin's very excellent critique of that story in turn in Little Atoms. Okay, so the format is as, you, as follows, I'm sure lots of you already know this. I question our speakers on the subject of algorithms and machine learning. We'll eventually open up the floor to you guys. Um, but I just thought, before I ask you those questions, I'm slightly throwing you all because I haven't told you this, but I thought because this is such an abstract topic, algorithms and machine learning, so I wondered if each of you could sketch out very briefly the parts of our lives where you think machine intelligence or an algorithm has had a really profound or powerful impact. I don't know if any of you could do that. I don't, I don't think we're the right people for that kind <laughs> of question, really. No, um, what do you mean, like, personally or, or everyone? For all of us, yeah. For all of us. <laughs> After you, Neil, I'm sure you've got some uh, profound thoughts. On I think that there's an interesting perception that this is a new thing. Um, one of the things I like to think about is um, uh, if you go back to stockbroking, that used to be a thing. Anyone here a stockbroker? I mean, they don't really exist anymore. They were sort of replaced <laughs> by algorithms. You, don't, you didn't see them on the street uh, begging. 
we did have some interesting effects, like in algorithmic trading led to big market crashes in the mid-80s. So I guess the thing I'd like to say, and, and some of the most interesting work about what it means to have data stored about you was written in the 70s. So, so I'd, I'd say it's not a new phenomenon, yeah. but perhaps it's getting closer to us with our mobile yeah. phones. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the obvious thing I think I could think about is uh, Google Maps. For me, that has it's an algorithm. It's developed on on data on algorithms. So for me, that has transformed my life. I think everybody here. Yeah, that's how I got here. Realize yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, things like that. But then again, uh, as you said, they are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They they are in the social sphere. They are in the courtrooms. They are in in the education system whether someone gets a job or not is judged and weighed by algorithms, so there. That's a very helpful example. I think those examples will emerge as we begin yeah. our discussion. Ebeba, you're going to start because um, I thought we'd get you to talk first because you work both in philosophy and in cognitive science, and I wondered if you could set up the nature of the relationship between the two. And I think the, qu the question I want to ask you is, is philosophy and the philosophical notions of personhood that philosophy produces, are those things up to the task of making sense of machine intelligence? Yeah, good question. Uh, so philosophy and science, uh, we, we usually approach philosophy and science as if they are something separate and something distinct, something that exists uh, completely independent of each other. And uh, sometimes even philosophy and science are uh, compared as if one is better than the other and questions such as is philosophy or science better uh, to answer such and such questions. I think that's any, any good philosopher or uh, any good scientist knows that that's a false dichotomy that's just unhelpful uh, because philosophy and science are interrelated, they develop together, they, are in, they, they depend on one another. And uh, the, one of the greatest, today's greatest philosopher, Daniel Dennett, has put this beautifully. Uh, he has said, there is no such thing as uh, philosophy-free science, but rather science that, uh, rather science w whose baggage has been cleared and that, uh, that we have taken on board without questioning its assumption or something to that extent. <laughs> and. Uh, I couldn't agree with him any anymore, and uh, even even bringing in my own uh, experience, uh, I see myself as both a scientist and a philosopher. I, as you said, I, I I'm in cognitive science, and cognitive science back in uh, University College Dublin is uh, run by the School of Philosophy and the School of Computer Science. So I work both with philosophers and scientists, and uh, it's. Uh, it's so obvious and so uh, clear to me that we need interdisciplinarity, we need philosophers and, and uh, scientists talking to each other and asking questions. We can't do without philosophy. Just coming back to machine intelligence itself, uh, if you want to develop some sort of machine intelligence or if you, if you even want to talk about <coughs> machine intelligence, you have to first clarify what machine intelligence is, and you have to define it, which brings us back to philosophy. And uh, it's not also, we, we don't just define and then we specify and then we go and study it. It's, uh, it's not as if the science is final and, and finished and then we move on. It's with everything else, our sciences also change, our interests change, our values change, so it's important to go back back to the philosophy and reevaluate and uh, reassess our definitions and our, our assumptions. And uh, again, coming back to my, my own experience, uh, as well as uh, uh, academic staff, I also work with students. I teach uh, data ethics to computer science students, data science students, data ethics and critical thinking. And I teach a uh, general introduction to ethics to uh, well, philosophy. Well, it's something we are trying uh, currently in in, uh, in the School of Computer Science in uh, University College Dublin. So, <laughs> it's mainly block or no. Uh, what we are trying to do, 
myself and my supervisor are trying to do is, uh, and the head of school trying to do is to, to get the students to think about whether there is such a thing as neutral technology or whether data can be biased or whether there's such a thing as uh, raw data or whether how we look for problems or where we look for problems, how we define our problems has implications and questions as what is ethical data and uh, what does it mean to be ethical, what's fairness and who does the work this data science do, who does it impact questions like that. So um, it started last summer and, and uh, this semester we have it up and running and uh, uh, so the, the contrast is really stark with my philosophy students and my data science students. With the data science students you see as, 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 well, as long as their codes are perfect they don't want to concern themselves with oh, what's ethical, or why should I think about correlation and causation, or why should I think about whether third parties are going to come and use my algorithms in a way that I didn't intend to, questions like that. They see them as philosophical and not something that they need to deal with, and what we are trying to do is to get them to think about these questions, because as we said at the beginning, algorithms are everywhere, these, the softwares and algorithms these uh, computer scientists develop are being used in the hospitals, in the courtrooms, in, in the, they are affecting uh, voting processes. So it's important to incorporate and to think about social issues, not just coding. I can see exactly <laughs> why that is the case as a philosopher, yeah. as someone who's watched the kind of political um, landscape alter in the last couple of years for particular reasons which you might talk about. But, um, how do they take it when you, do, do they, do, do your computer scientists have, find themselves in moral crises or what, what happens? Uh, at the beginning, uh, I found it really difficult to engage with them because they simply are not interested. And last semester what we did was make it as, uh, make it carry a heavy grade. So it was 20% of the, they were, <laughs> they were <laughs> so, <laughs> so. 20% then they, they started engaging and they started also getting interested and uh, one of the toughest question is even when they are interested, even when we have these open conversations, their question is, okay, so I can see how this could be a problem or I can see uh, what I'm doing could impact a certain demographic or a certain group of people, but why should it be up to me? Why, why won't the people who are going to employ me, why why, why isn't it up to them? Why shouldn't you go and have the same conversation with them? And I don't know the answer to that, but that's a really interesting question. Who is responsible? Yeah, so they yeah. the, the think that they, they're um, deferring the responsibility to, or they're delegating the responsibility to a user or the people who um, implement the, the software rather than make the software. I, I think it's a fair question. It's, they, do, they do carry some of the, respons the responsibility, but not all of it. And uh, you have to be fair as well. You don't want to think, you don't want to make them think it's all up to them. It's up to everybody. It's up to every citizen and individual to be aware, to make ourselves aware. But it's also up to the, the organizations and companies to be responsible and to think these things through. Yeah. Um, Neil, I wonder if you've got any response to that as one of those heartless, amoral data scientists. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, it's, I mean, it's not, um, so it, it's very challenging, right? Because um, one of the ways we automate systems is we compartmentalize them. So we take uh, a process and we try and say, oh, we can take this component and we can automate that. And that goes back to sort of like manufacturing the Ford Model T or um, Sheffield, where I'm from, how they made cutlery and they did it in different places. Um, and of course, this brings about an isolation between um, those who are making some of these decisions and those who are being affected by these decisions. And uh, I think that that's a big challenge. Um, and it's also hard if the data ethics course doesn't resonate with the people that they don't understand why that's the case. But you know, I think we're seeing good examples in terms of the consequences of this now. So it should be, somehow it should be easier to, to, to explain to people what, why this what is important. Do you mean by 
Well, I think there's a lot of concern now about, um, uh, you know, we're seeing, for example, a lot of the Russian interference in the U.S. election is, 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 you know, and this is all, I haven't read the details about it, but one of the cases is that there was an influence by spending money on particular advertising and, re and tweet, uh, uh, Twitter bots uh, reinforcing uh, divisions in society. Now, um, that's interesting because that's humans actually interfering in, in a system which is manipulative. And then, of course, you want algorithmic defenses. But, you know, you sort of see, I think that there's a history to these sort of things. There's a history from statistics where, um, I, I, I love the quote, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. Um, now, that quote is a Mark Twain quote from the turn of this century, but he's crediting it to Disraeli. Um, uh, whether that's true, Disraeli said it or not. But, but the point is that that predates... Um, the mathematical analysis and understanding of fairness and proof in statistics. It comes from a time when people were just summing up numbers and making broad claims. Not that that happens at all today. <laughs> but it, in areas like um, uh, sort of drugs trials or in, you know, there are, there are <coughs> standards for well-designed experiments that, that, you know, I mean, there are problems. Ben Goldacre talks a lot about them. But there are standards about how you should do these things. And, and I think we're, we're just entering a another era where the nature of the data we're getting is, is somewhat different and we're, we're having to think through those things again. Um, and, and it's not easy, because it's not easy for someone to understand all the computer science they need, uh, get a sense of how data works and then understand a widely societal ethical issues. And, and the really interesting part about it is that when people were just doing these things on small scale, often it didn't matter so much that their algorithm had a bit of bias in it, something like that. Uh, because they were deploying in a small scale. But when you were deploying it across a billion people, it matters a lot, right? So, so you know, the, those systems can be manipulated because of the scale they're operating at and because they're just computer code, so humans can manipulate them. Yeah. And, and this really changes the way we think. H historically in statistics, I, I've done a lot of things with statisticians, statisticians are always nervous to talk about the conclusion of the model. For example, we were doing a, a workshop on spatial disease and in particular monitoring of malaria in um, sub-Saharan Africa. And we had the leading authority in malaria there. And when he was presenting his latest speculative model, he asked for the camera to be switched off. Not because he was embarrassed about what he was going to say, but because what he says about where malaria is and the effect of net programs in Uganda and Kenya leads to decisions being made that hundreds of millions of dollars being spent or decisions about you know how large charities are doing their business so he, when he was making a speculative conscious. claim he's very conscious now I, I shut up such decisions are always conscious of that because this one thing they're going to say is going to result in deaths or large money spend or whatever like that it's much harder when a data scientist well all I'm doing is classifying a face yeah. now when it turns out that that face classification works better for some races than others and you've deployed it you know, across the world, and that you've therefore um, uh, basically um, discriminated against a subsection of the population, then there's a problem. But it's not so immediately obvious to the algorithm designer. Is that right, Martin, as a, as a journalist and as someone who's been surveying this landscape, that the scalability of the algorithm and its, um, and its range, the range of its deployment, has made it a much more pressing problem for us? Um, Yes and no. So I, I agree completely that the, the scalability of an algorithm is, is one of the key sort of ratchets for the influence that it has on the world. That's, that's kind of a pretty obvious thing. Um, one of the best ways to completely derail a conversation is to get bogged down in definitions. So kind of in that mm -hmm. spirit, um, I think it's really important to sort of step back and just say, what do we actually mean by an algorithm? And in a, a very sort of abstract sense, we're just talking about a sort of a sequence of instructions that's being replicated at some kind of scale. Um, and that's not a particularly new thing, and it's not a particularly new thing at a scale of billions of people. Uh, Neil mentioned the Model T Ford. You can look at things like McDonald's, for example. The success of Ray Kroc in spreading that franchise was around coming up with a specific set of instructions and rolling that out on a colossal scale that had never really been seen before. That, much like Facebook today, then led to a whole load of unforeseen consequences, mainly people getting very fat uh, and unhealthy. <laughs> and, uh, and then sort of in order to try and sort of deal with that, you know, suddenly we've got an obesity crisis, some, suddenly people are talking about, oh, you know, we're going to, you know, McDonald's are going to start selling salads now and that's going to make everyone, you know, and there's a bit of apple in the pies and that's, you know, that's nutrition and everyone will be fine again. Shockingly, that didn't really work particularly well. 
Uh, and McDonald's is still there and everyone's still getting fat. And, and I think there's kind of a lesson there. One of the things that I really kind of reject as a central premise is the idea that, you know, we built something like Facebook and now there's like a problem and we just have to kind of fix the problem. Uh, like, you know, people talk about fake news as if it's like, oh, well, you know, we had Facebook and Twitter and they were fine until two years ago. And then, oh, suddenly, you know, there was the Brexit thing happening and Nigel Farage and some nasty people did some bad things on social media and that ruined it. And, you know, then the Russian trolls came along and suddenly, you know, Facebook wasn't good and, and they bought ads and X, Y, Z. But that doesn't get into the point that these systems, much like McDonald's before it, much like the Model T Ford and internal combustion engines before that, are things that were fundamentally flawed from the start and had serious negative consequences that are baked into that fundamental design that you can't simply just, you know, post hoc design your way out of. Hmm. Um, I think that that's the key thing. And, you know, a lot of the issues we're seeing now, you know, again, looking at another term, sort of artificial intelligence and a lot of the, the fear about, you know, how do we govern kind of big, uncontrollable systems that are making decisions on behalf of humanity with potentially negative consequences? I, I don't want to sound all kind of Jeremy Corbyn, but we already have those systems. They're called massive corporations. And I'm not saying that in a kind of, you know, all capitalism is bad kind of sense. And I'm also not saying it in a kind of abstract philosophical sense. I mean that in a very practical sense. Like we're already wrestling with these problems. And one of the things I find kind of a little bit frustrating about the whole discussion around algorithms and AI is that the complexity of the technology involved has almost sort of allowed a kind of mythology to build up around these companies and what they're doing. And the fact that, you know, oh, Google's gonna create a superhuman AI that's gonna, you know, ruin the world someday. Um, Google already is a superhuman, artificially intelligent entity. It's already making decisions that affect millions, billions of people on a daily basis. And there's a frighteningly small amount of kind of governance and oversight when it comes to actually how those decisions are made and the impacts that we had. And we probably won't know all of the impacts for, you know, probably even by the ends of our lifetimes. There'll still be stuff that's coming out about the, the effects of this. I might probe you a bit later about the difference between an egg McMuffin and Google Maps. But um, I want to, thank you, Bebe, I want to move on to, to Neil because um, <coughs> just to go back to these, to, to take a few steps back to go back to these definitions. Mm. Um, Neil, I want to ask you to set out some of the differences or the distinctions between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence because I think you understand that relationship as you understand it in ways that are not obvious and quite striking, I think. So, yeah, I'm um, uh, yeah, just to Martin's uh, definition. I agree uh, a lot with what Martin said about <coughs> the sort of scope. One, that term algorithm is definitely how a computer scientist sees it, but I think the term has come to take on a different meaning amongst the wider population, which is very much driven by algorithms that combine data and models together. So, that in some sense, your data is being used. So, it just, I think a lot of the public think of it that way, um, although your, your definition is the sort of computer science one. But yeah, coming back to the natural intelligence versus artificial intelligence, I think that um, I really dislike artificial intelligence as a term, and I, <laughs> I, I've thought about it a fair amount, um, uh, and then I've tried to help people understand what the differences are by describing some differences between natural and artificial intelligence. And I think broadly speaking, the ones I wanted to touch on today, there's two. One is contextual, and one I think is more systemic. So um, one is to do with the way they're being produced. So let's start with the systemic one. So that is that natural intelligences that, that we have um, are very much evolved. Um, and th th if anything's evolved, it basically has this first rule, don't fail. Um, we operate in an extremely uncertain dynamic environment and, and the challenges we're going to get faced with on a day-to-day -day basis are varying all the time. And, and one of the, and it's true for natural systems in general, evolutionary systems, I mean, when you, you can see that evolution, when you look at computational biology and look at the way the cells um, uh, evolved, very specifically saying evolved, not designed, um, there's enormous redundancy in it. Uh, because, of course, the cell has had to deal with um, failures brought about by uncontrolled environmental conditions um, and a need to, well, it doesn't have a need to, but if it doesn't survive, we don't see it. It's a very simple thing. I mean, Darwinism is like, well, if it didn't work, it disappears. So the ones that didn't have redundancy and uh, flexibility um, don't exist. So their first sort of goal is, 
I mean, they don't have goal. It's not really a goal, but we only see them if they didn't fail. Yes, you have to survive. You have to survive in order to be seen today. It's not that intelligence needs to survive. You could have a good intelligence that is, is trying to do something else, but if it didn't, if it, in, innately, if it's not there, then, you know, we don't see it. So the natural intelligences we see are also subject to these influences, and they're super flexible. And I think that the interesting thing is they prior, you know, then they may become efficient a particular task after they've, they've ticked this, I, I'm flexible enough to, like, someone threw a ball at me and I blocked it away and did all these other things, and uh, oh my goodness, I'm in the meeting talking about AI and there's microphones and electronics and there's a computer. Wow. I mean, what all this stuff we can do is super flexible to our changing environment. If you look at the way we automate in practice, uh, all these examples that, that were named, we control the environment first. You, you remove that uncertainty, right? So the systems that we design and deploy, the first thing you do is you say, well, I'm going to tr control the environment around them. So, so good candidates for AI solutions are things where there's a sort of, um, uh, what's the, you know, a compartmentalized thing where I can say, put something in here, protect it from complexity on the outside. Like get from Hoban to the LSE. Yeah, you know, on a map where we've got all the information, uh, as was mentioned before, and I've got all the routing, now I can deploy a pathfinding algorithm very easily and do that. I've controlled, uh, and it, that's why we can do so much, because we, we, we're controlling things in mobile phones. Um, and, and, but the AIs we're designing, um, we, and these are designed, and most design things are designed efficiently. So what you'll see is we, when humans design things, we very rarely put large amounts of redundancy in it, unless there's safety criticality, like an aircraft. Um, we tend to have very efficient processes that are sort of algorithmic, as, as Martin was describing, the, the rollout of, uh, the way you do that at scale is you just, you don't think, you just do this, 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 you know, that's the seven things. Don't you come in with your natural intelligence and start thinking about this, follow these instructions. Yeah. That's not very natural for humans, but that's how you make something very efficient. Of course, that efficient thing, when it's exposed to some disruption, when you know, Martin's persuaded everyone about the dangers of eating these things, it just fails because it's not adaptable. And that's, that's the systemic sort of just the consequences of the way they've been brought about. That you know, one, you're trying to put the minimal resource in to achieve a very set task, and the other one gets to do that once it's worked out how to just uh, procreate. So that's the one I think of the systemic. You thing. make us sound amazing, and artificial intelligence sounds like <coughs> the, the Dalek that hits the stairs. Yeah, I mean, we are amazing. <laughs> I mean, all of us. And actually, everything around us. The natural world is amazing. It's beautiful. And um, I, I think that the, the one, I think the reason we're fascinated by AI, and the reason it's a bad term, but also it, there is an interesting side to it, is understanding AI just gets us a better understanding of ourselves. Like, if you go back to Turing, the cybernetics people like this, they worried about how do humans think. They tried to put it in logical terms. It turns out, no, it's not like that. You just get deeper and deeper into what it is about us. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that, you know, that that's what, the, the, yeah, as yeah, you yeah. said, the philosophy to yes. science, yeah, the yeah. possibility for interaction. I mean, we are compartmentalized yeah. in these fields. And, and cognitive science, yeah. and the, all the interesting stuff is gonna, for me, gonna happen at the interface, which is actually the most sparsely populated what portion. What do you mean by the interface? Of these fields. <laughs> I, I actually, I quite agree with you about the, the complexity and ambiguity of reality. Mm. And uh, uh, this is a, a section of my PhD, actually. What I'm proposing is uh, uh, we have this Cartesian approach to the mind or the person, which is very, uh, you know, autonomous and self-determined and self-sustaining kind of independent entity that we have inherited from Descartes, even from before. And the way we think about humans is uh, as if something that, you know, that, that exists on an island, we kind of move away, we, we, we discard the ambiguities and the complexities of reality. But when you think about it, we can't exist. There is no mind independent of others. We need others, mm -hmm. we need relationships, we need interactions, even in order to know our own selves, in, to know who we are. Our sense of selves comes from what others tell us, what we get from others, and how we interact and how we communicate with others. So others and, and relationships and acknowledging these uh, complex realities is uh, really important. And what Descartes was, was trying to do in uh, attempting to establish this uh, clear ground, uh, this completely certain ground was to kind of define and 
just <coughs> get rid of uncertainty, saying that didn't help because reality is not like that. That sounds like you're saying that Descartes is the da Dalek. Uh, <laughs> There's something <laughs> relational and yeah. networky about human yes. beings yeah. already. But that begs the question, I think, that you're getting to here, which is that we're finessing machine intelligence to the point that it's able to isolate specifically what's brilliant and unique about us. What is that thing? Well, I don't think it isolates it. I think as we study it, we get further into... I think, you know, Descartes didn't see computers, didn't know about Turing, didn't know about all these things. So these are wonderful thoughts in the time, and we're just really lucky because we communicate, because we can share ideas. And I think that that is the, the, the second fundamental difference, is that, is that contextual one that I think you were touching on. Um, and, and just to sort of look at the mathematics of it is... Um, the way in which we are constrained to communicate. So coming back to the natural, one of the reasons the natural world is beautiful is actually the way things um, do extraordinary things in the face of constraints. Or, you know, why do they end up doing these amazing, you know, a, a colleague of mine once said, if, if, the, if plants had property rights, the world would just be covered in grass. Uh, I'm not sure that's true, but what he meant was that if you were just trying to most efficiently use the power of the sun, you wouldn't cheat by growing up grow. you would just say let's cover everything yeah. in solar panels you know in, in the most efficient way have them tilt a bit but, but, but if you're shading someone else you're just not using the sun efficiently now we could have that but it's not a very interesting world um but I th so i think that the, you know because you don't have those communication constraints all the plants don't agree let's share equally the sun you get these interesting things happening now in humans um, we're in a very interesting position. It's a very big difference between us and, and, and the machine intelligences we build. Um, I call it uh, the sort of embodiment factor of these things. It relates to sort of embodied cognition. The, a computer, um, the, if, you if you were trying to simulate the human brain in terms of all its actions, you would require a computer which is about the size of the Met Office computer, which I think costs 250 million, and it's like the 11th fastest computer in the world. Simulates our weather every day, predictively we're going to be frozen in, everything else. <laughs> Simulates also the climate, does all these things. And, and um, you would need a computer that size to simulate our brain, which is a lot faster than a regular computer. Um, now, uh, a regular computer's slower than that, but the interesting thing... So our, our, you know, if we try and use that as a proxy for how much computation we do, and when I'm saying computation, I'm not thinking like our times tables. I'm talking about the neurons firing at the low level, the stuff that is below our consciousness. Um, there's an incredible amount of computation going on that we don't have access to in our conscious selves or in any other form. Um, now, a com if we were to try and... Uh, if you took a computer, it's got less computation, but it can communicate with a much higher bandwidth. So to put that in context, computers... Communicate, typical computers communicate less than that, but if you were to take one second of computation that a computer did and communicate all of it, it would take you about 20 minutes to do so. So if you, a modern processor at modern sort of um, uh, Wi-Fi speeds, which sounds slow, but if you were to do the same thing with a human, it would take you 15 billion years. Right. Because computers can communicate at about a gigabit a second, and we can communicate at about 100 bits per second. So this is billionaires versus I've got 100 quid. Um, it's a massive difference, yeah. and it makes an enormous difference in the way the intelligences work. So um, what we have to do to get over this, because I'm trying to communicate with you now, what I sort of intuitively have inside is I have a sense that you're all humans and you understand the same thing as me. So I use analogies. I say small things to try and bring your mind in line with my mind, you know, tell stories or whatever else. But it's all very reliant on having a model of what you're like, which is to your point, and we are defined by what others think about us. And this is like a shared strategy. We all have to agree to do this or else it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So we have to sort of, in order to predict what's going to happen in a certain circumstance, I have to have a good model of everyone here. Computers don't do that at all. So to me, that drives our sense of self. That drives our ability to operate in a society and, and how we think in isolation from that. You don't need that in a computer. You never needed that because right from day one, I sometimes call it a locked-in intelligence, right? We're locked in. The computer wasn't really locked in. It can just share everything it sees. It's always talking. Yeah. So it's much more like a sensor network. You know, it's much more like if we distribute eight of us around the building, we can constantly communicate with each other what we see, and we've got a shared. We don't need to have this very complex way of, oh, maybe Martin doesn't like what I'm saying. Maybe he's going to get angry. <laughs> you know, maybe he's scratching <laughs> his thing. You know, all this stuff that I'm processing subconsciously and consciously. Yeah. 
Um, we don't have to do that in a computer because it's just like, you know, the way this would work is we would all come in within uh, Wi-Fi range of each other and we would go, Shh, and then we would all leave. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it could have been done. Yeah. <laughs> it's intriguing. From what, I, from what I can understand, that means basically that we human beings are better computers than computers, but computers are better communicators than we are. Yes. That's a very perverse sort of formulation. But it is, but then there's something, that's at the base level. That there's another level at which communication, a good communicator among humans is someone who can understand what to say to sort of tweak the other person into thinking the thought that they want. And that becomes very complicated. It's a wonderful game, actually, because imagine we're in a society that's trying to do this, and somehow this thing becomes like the way that we uh, perform sexual selection, how good we are at this. Then all of a sudden... The, the ones that are best at doing it will typically mate together and produce uh, offspring that are even better at doing it. But then it gets harder because you're always second-guessing each other. It's sort of like the sort of from Russian dolls effect. And you can see how that could lead to runaway intelligence, yeah. but it's a social intelligence. That's yeah. the thing that gets me about it. If that's true, and I'm not an evolutionary or socio, whatever, one of those anthropologists, <laughs> and I don't even know if they exist... Uh, but if that were the case, that would imply that our intelligence is entirely social. Yeah. And then there's this side effect that, oh, we can do math. So I'm, I'm going to move on to Martin quickly, but a question for all of you, really. Can we teach our mis machines to be social? What I mean by that is that if the machine intelligence is driven by the imperative of efficiency, and um, can we teach it, you, you know, in the way that the, the law aspires to justice or fairness, and art aspires to beauty. Can we teach the machine to aspire to things that are not efficiency, beauty, fairness, justice? Well, yeah, my, own answer, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my own answer is that we end up doing that merely to emulate, to create an interface to the computer that we find easy and responsive right. to communicate with. I mean, I think that you can never replace... So I like... OK, I, I said I dislike the term artificial intelligence, but I like it in the way that it's like an artificial plant. You will make something yeah. that looks all right, and, and maybe it, it, it's functional in some ways. Like, I did put some artificial plants in my house. I don't have to water them. That's nice. But it's not the same, and it never can be, because there's this entire co-evolved history of what we are, and, you know, the, the, you can have a computer emulate by watching humans do it a lot, but it wasn't there. You know, or we could suck it all out of our heads in some weird way that some people propose and then put it in a computer. I don't know. Is it different then? Um, actually, Turing was fighting this argument, by the way, with the Turing test. Turing's, uh, Turing test argument was was to fight what I'm saying. So, by the way, there is another side, which is like, look, if you were to interface with a computer in such a way that you couldn't tell it wasn't human, then you've created intelligence. So he was trying to fight what I'm saying, which is you can never truly emulate the human intelligence. So I might be wrong about that. You know, Turing was smart. It's <laughs> nice to have a, a skeptic in the House of Amazon about whether we want our machines to emulate us. It sounds like you don't, interestingly. But I want to move to Martin before we open up to you guys. Um, and I mentioned, Martin, the Cambridge Analytica story, which was uh, reported in Vice and was a big story. I think lots of you read it and um, have followed it up avidly with all the inquiries into Russian interference. And you wrote the critique of it about um, how uh, effectively that targeted marketing could have impacted or affected the outcome of the US election. Um, and I think you're questioning whether da data mining really could accomplish something like that. Do you think we're living in a, it sounds like you don't think we're living in a brave new algorithmic age because McDonald's are doing it already, as you keep saying, but is our anxiety about this misplaced then? Should we all just relax? Um, okay, so let, let, let me try and deal with the whole previous conversation and then segue <laughs> neatly into that. Yeah. So we've established that computers and human beings are different things, which I think is, is good. Yeah. Uh, that's that's yeah. a point I think most of us can agree on. Um, something that really comes out of that is why we're so obsessed with computers being like people in the first place. And something I just really wanted to come into, although it's a little bit of a, a tangent from the rest, is the extent to which there's kind of a community of people who are obsessed with the idea that like a, a super intelligence is going to come down from the heavens and rule over the earth and it's going to grant us immortality by allowing our minds to meld mm -hmm. with the computers and the internet and uh, you know all this kind of thing. And um, it's hard to look at a lot of that and not see the makings of essentially a kind of machine-based religion. There are even people around the sort of, you know, kind of transhumanist, ethical altruist and so on movement who 
say that it's possible that we're living in a simulation being run by an AI and that therefore we should all behave ourselves just in case it turns <laughs> out and it's a logical thing to do. So it's remarkable how we've, we've used this, kind of like the search for extraterrestrial life, um, not just to sort of explore our own intelligence, but to sort of answer some kind of weird, deep-seated psychological human need for a greater power and, and companionship and, and so on. Um, segue. Uh, so that brings me on to the sort of, you know, the, the sheer unlikeliness of big tech companies currently to ever deliver that kind of thing. And I think, you know, I talked about this a lot last year um, in a TEDx talk that none of you have seen because there were technical problems and the video didn't get posted. Because the sentient AI prevented it being broadcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and now the, the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. <laughs> Had you seen it, it was amazing. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but what's what's really, really interesting to me about the sort of field of, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, is actually the sheer lack of progress being made in any tangible way in the products and the services that we actually use. Um, I was thinking about this the other day, actually in response to your question at the beginning, you were saying, you know, what are the things that have really transformed in the age of algorithms? And there are some things, things like how we consume information, that's being sort of condensed down to a, a much sort of narrower set of sources for the entire human race than existed previously. Um, but when you look at a lot of those impacts, they're all actually quite old. And when you look at the sites and the services that we use on a, a daily basis, if Facebook is like 10, 15 years old, Twitter is 10 years old, Wikipedia is 15 years old, uh, Google is 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, you know, even things like sort of Netflix is, is over 10 years old. If you actually try and find examples of major innovation resulting from AI, that's been actually delivered in terms of tangible products that you use on a daily basis in the last 10 years, it's incredibly difficult to do. And actually more than that, a lot of the products that we use in that time, a lot of people would argue that they've deteriorated in quality. So we see, for example, the problems emerging with Facebook and Twitter. People's experiences on those sites are, are declining, even though Facebook has one of the biggest research teams on the planet in this kind of area. Um, you look at things like Google and, and their search results and the extent to which they're packed with sort of very clever gimmicks like surfacing Wikipedia articles higher in the rankings um, that don't necessarily um, deliver anything that's particularly intelligent. Even when you look at examples of um, you know, applied machine learning that have had a breakthrough, like things like Siri voice assistance or um, translation, um, around voice assistance, a lot of that improvement's been down to improvements in miniaturizing microphones and improved microphone technology. And self-driving cars, one of the reasons why self-driving cars in some respects are more feasible than self-driving trains when you might think it would be the opposite is that actually the sensors on cars, the, the speed that a car moves and the, the time and distance that it can break within, the sensors are able to sort of scan that area very quickly, very accurately. On a, a large freight train that needs like a two mile stopping distance, we actually don't really have the sensor technology to, to cope with those kinds of distances. And so it was all these kinds of areas of advancement where for whatever the PR departments of these companies are saying, it's not actually necessarily the magic black boxes that are doing it, it's other kind of practical applications. And that was sort of bringing back to the whole story with Cambridge Analytica and the idea that um, you know, this ability to, to, to target ads was you know, purely what, what swung elections, that as sophisticated as those technologies are, and I'm certainly not saying that advertising, advertising money spent doesn't have an impact, but that I suspect that their ability to target people on that kind of level is somewhat overrated, just purely on the basis of things like, for example, I regularly receive advertisements for height boosting shoes, <laughs> even though I'm six foot one. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of this, you know, and, and it comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, that there's this really infuriating lack of skepticism. I'm, I'm not saying, by the way, that there's not advances being made and that there aren't interesting things being done and that some products aren't being improved. But there's this just sort of utter lack of skepticism in the, the face of some of the claims being made that's kind of leading people to assume that some of these companies and businesses are almost wielding like a supernatural ability to influence the course of human affairs. And I, I just think we need to be a little bit careful of how much we fall for that and end up doing effectively a PR job on behalf of those firms. So, but, um, so you're saying we, we, um, ought, we ought to be more sceptical that these um, apparent machine intelligences are not 
having the effect that they're claiming to. But this is a different question. Should we mobilise algorithms for the purposes of social engineering? You're saying it's not happening or the <coughs> technology isn't up to it, but should we be doing that? I don't mean we should be rigging elections for anybody, but I think maybe we should we be mobilising algorithms to stop the person who loves McDonald's going to McDonald's and direct them to you know the vegan grocer down the road instead? <laughs> should we be social engineering with those algorithms? I mean, we already are. I mean, everything, our whole society is built around social engineering. There's a bunch of people that do it to sell products. Uh, governments use things like, you know, nudge theory and social engineering when they um, set things like tax policy. I mean, you, you, on a very basic level, um, tariffs on, you know, the price of a pint of beer is a form of kind of social engineering through policy. Um, so, so it, in a sense, like, I, I almost slightly reject the question because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 you almost can't not do it. Like on, on some level, that's just how society yeah. is structured, I guess. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good moment to bring in our philosopher. Should we be doing? Yeah, yeah. Just, just, uh, just to get back to what Neil said earlier, uh, <coughs> the fact that we are seeing consequences and now we are starting to think about we should be ethical in our designs. Uh, so one of the things I try to get my students is to think about what could possibly happen, what could possibly be the consequences before it happens. I think this is why we need ethical education and critical thinking in, in data science, in, in computer science. And uh, also talking about AI, not the kind of AI maybe uh, Neil and Martin are talking about, strictly speaking, but the kind of AI that is uh, ubiquitous, that, that uh, influences our everyday life uh, it's uh, so it's it's a little bit uh, different f from yours um, mm -hmm. they do affect people's lives and uh, to just to give you an example uh, you've probably heard of it uh, probably probably cast case uh, where they were using algorithms to determine whether someone is likely to commit crime or not and uh, so many investigations later they found out the alg the black worm black <laughs> algorithms by nature are black boxes even for those uh, AI experts who designs who design them and so many uh, experts and so many critics and so much work later they have decided that the algorithm that has that have been used over many years that has affected many people's lives uh, was racist and sexist and it was uh, judging people differently for exactly the same crime and now it has been stopped. So we don't have to go through that phase. We don't have to affect so many lives. We can, we have to think about these things in advance. And uh, this, one of the reasons this uh, comes to, this becomes a problem is uh, that the AI industry is uh, very homogenous. It's mainly, it mainly contains a white, you know, uh, European men. So uh, look at, uh, soap dispensers not being able to uh, recognize dark colored skins. You've probably seen the video, it, it went viral. Uh, I'm sure the people who designed those, they didn't say, I don't want black people to, to get hands so <laughs> soap for their hands. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't do that on purpose. But we need uh, you know, diversity in, in these huge tech companies <coughs> in our computer science departments. And we have uh, face recognition algorithms that don't recognize uh, black people's face. We don't have to wait for these things to happen. We, we need to diversify our tech industry and, and think critically and, and yeah. think ethically. Uh, and, uh, I think that, that's important for, for businesses as well because uh, you know, in recent years I've seen so many examples of Silicon Valley startups that have done things like, oh, there's the famous example of the, the $400 juicer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> someone's bought one that. Um, there's, there's the, um, uh, there was another one I saw the other day, which was somebody who, who apparently they were trekking in the Himalayas and they saw that some people in villages didn't have access to clean water. So they, they set their sort of big tech minds at creating a much more efficient water filtering system. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it retailed for something like $300 again. And it's like, well, <laughs> You're, you're, it's ridiculous. Like you, you've just got a bunch of people who have almost no experience of a huge chunk of the world, even in the suburbs of their own city in San Francisco, let alone what you know the needs and wants of people in other countries or other nations. Um, and it's really, really damaging for those businesses. And 
you know, you see, we're in a we're in a situation now where people can walk into a VC office with, you know, a PowerPoint slide that says blockchain on it and walk out again with five million dollars. And my serious, you know, try it you know, seriously. <laughs> 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 And, uh, and my serious concern is we're sort of heading for a real bubble again in, in, in you know, the sheer disconnect between the thinking around products that people actually want and need and, and would buy and, and this bubble of very strange people riding around on motorized scooters in San Francisco. Well, no, can I get you in there because um, you're our inside man. <laughs> And we're not, I'm, I'm, and it's I do have a motorized scooter. <laughs> <laughs> it's important not to um, pretend that we're talking about a faceless, anonymized... We're talking about Neil. <laughs> <laughs> ...mathematically generated algorithm. We're talking about people who make algorithms. And should we, should we trust in them? And is that landscape changing? I think it's interesting. I mean, I'd like to connect some of the things that were said, actually. Um, there's a danger in assuming just because you get diverse people, this is going to fit. I don't think it's going to fix it. I mean, this problem... Yeah, it's, it's yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> the point Martin was sort of saying, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I love diversity for many good reasons. It actually might accelerate innovation. So it may be more dangerous to have diverse groups of people making successful products than instead of crap products that no one buys and failing businesses, because diversity does lead to success and innovation. But let me pull back and talk about what we're deploying. Uh, there's a fundamental issue, which I think uh, relates to um, some of what Martin was, was saying earlier about why are these algorithms getting worse? Why is Twitter getting worse? Why is Facebook getting worse? If you deploy a system like this, you are deploying... So in that sense, you are deploying algorithmic things that are consistent and repeatable. And the reason, and as I said, the point I was making, it was kind of humans that interfered with these systems, not algorithms, because you can find the weak points. This happened to Google in the early days as well. The reason they, they do all sorts of things to their initial, their initial algorithm was called PageRank. It was very simple, wonderful algorithm. It looked at the linkage of the internet. It uh, did uh, sort of, uh, it extracted the first, uh, the smallest eigenvector of the internet. Um, uh, which is equivalent to the largest eigenvector of the inverse matrix of the internet, which would be <laughs> impossible to compute. And it ranked pages according to that. And it worked wonderfully well. And then people knew how it was working, so they started gaming it. Because it's one algorithm, and if people go to your page, you make a lot of money. And when people start gaming it, then they, oh, people are gaming it this way, I have to put this in. Put you know, they spent enormous amounts of time adding things, as Martin was saying, around also the Wikipedia thing. For ages, answers.com, which was just a mirror site for Wikipedia, was higher up than Wikipedia, uh, which was bizarre. I mean, it was a number of years ago. Um, now, all that's going on is the same thing. When you've, when you've got an algorithm that decides what your ads ranking is or what your page rank is or any of these things, humans are pretty clever. You only need to require a few trials to see what its weak point is, and then you can start messing with it. And now these companies have to give a response. So, you know, to the point about diversity, the big challenge is the thing, as I, as I was trying to point out before, the thing that you deploy with an artificial intelligence is one very large algorithm that performs in the same way. So regardless of who it's being prejudiced against, even if we get everyone to sort of say, oh, look, we can see that this one is conforming to GDPR in terms of it's not discriminating on the basis of race, uh, sex, or religion, or health, which I think is the four protected categories for discrimination, it will perhaps start discriminating, as an example I use, against cyclists. <laughs> and, 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 and then all of a sudden they're pushed out of society. Let's you don't get, know. I'm making a passive defense for cyclists, but let's get Martin, because you had a critique. Of I think, well, uh, it, it's just like, I mean, you know, I'm sure your eigenvector thingy was beautiful. <laughs> um, but if it can be beaten by, you know, Joe MAGA hat wearing person from Kansas, then maybe it's not as clever as you originally thought. No, no one said it. I was saying it's not clever, it's fragile. That's but exactly the point I was yeah, making. Yeah. These systems are fragile because they're predictable. And you, not the people who are designing these things can't say, they can't consider every corner case because it's in an uncontrolled environment. No, but if you have a more diverse group of people considering it in the first place, you tend to get more different <laughs> answers about how these things go wrong. You look at social media, for example, you look That's, at... I, I Twitter. love diversity, but I really think people are very mistaken if they think this will be fixed by diversity. I don't think it'll be fixed. Wikipedia is the example it's I remember, that Wikipedia, in the last year or so, they've had this um, campaign to recruit women entering more female biographers and data into Wikipedia and people of colour. That seems to be a concerted effort to um, counter the fact that the gatekeepers of that Wikipedia data are largely geeky, <coughs> a certain complexion and age. I think that's a different thing. I think that's very true, yeah. yeah. Can I, I mean, Wikipedia is very much a cultural reflection, but it's much more a social thing. The point I'm trying to make with this is, 
is different from that. Wikipedia is uh, many people editing in parallel, something that everyone can see. What I'm the point I'm trying to make is, even if you have a diverse group of people, there's a lovely diverse group of people here, if we design an algorithm, it bottlenecks through that algorithm. And that algorithm itself is not diverse. Why we value diversity in society is because many of us make different decisions about things faced with different information. That's very difficult to gain. Let me give you an example. Can I? Driverless cars. If we have driverless cars that we know won't crash into you, we will have chaos because everyone will walk out in front of them. The reason that doesn't happen is because no one trusts humans to not crash into you. So as soon as you get these non-diversities, even if they're safe, you get these dangerous behaviors occurring. And as we introduce more and more of this into uncontrolled society, it's phenomenological. It can't be fixed by, oh, let's think about different things, because whatever you deploy will have this flaw. OK, it's, it's not driverless, drive, driverless cars that I'm concerned about, that only a tiny majority, a, a tiny minority of people are going to own and uh, control. M my concern is these huge algorithms, these huge softwares deployed by profit companies that work for profit, whose aims are just efficiency and making money, making <coughs> profits at the cost of fairness, at the cost of they don't care if it's discriminatory or not as long as they are making money. But can I also say all these uh, uh, problems or racial issues or uh, sexism that have been pointed out, out are by uh, uh, minority people by, by black yeah, women, absolutely. and uh, without their help, with, without their work, we, we wouldn't even see whether algorithms are being fair or not, because people see algorithms, they just take them as neutral, something that's, uh, that can't have opinions or values. I need to but clarify, I am absolutely not arguing that white men should design no, 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 these things. I'm just saying that the, the diversity doesn't fix the problem, it, it's still there. It, 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 no, it, it does that, to some extent, um, it does to I'm, some extent. I'm going to, um, I think nobody thinks that, and I think um, it's getting heated and interesting. <laughs> and I want to um, check that our audience, us, our NI, not AI, so I'm going to throw open to them. Um, they might throw us to the dogs. There might be some dialects too. Um, we've got a roving mic, so perhaps you can raise your hand if you have questions. But my plan is to try and take three at a time. So are there questions? There are. So there's a gentleman there. Uh, yes, just to um, take it away from the heated environment that we're getting into. Um, I've got a question I'd like to direct it to Neil initially, although others may have. Um, you were talking uh, um, a while ago about um, how in the realm of machine learning, um, we start off with a controlled environment in order to minimize the th things that we have to deal with and be able to target the, the machine to do its particular task. Uh, but what about um, genetic algorithms where basically you simply uh, maybe design three or four different um, algorithms and then you effectively take the ones that get the best result and um, swap parameters with each other in, in, the way that, uh, in, in a way that mimics um, mm. uh, sexual reproduction, if you like. Uh, add a few um, mutations at random, and then keep, keep breeding these um, until you actually get something that, that comes up with uh, a consistently good result. Um, now, you're not going to know what you've got. You know what it does. You'll have an algorithm that actually produces a, a great result of some sort, but because of the way it's been developed, nobody designed it, and you won't know how it does what it does or why or how to adjust it if it's not doing it properly. So basically I'd like to ask you, what do you think about the um, dangers or the benefits of, of such um, types of machine learning you know, ba based on that okay, principle? Okay, question along there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for uh, Abi uh, Abiba, and I'm so sorry if I mangled your name. Um, my question is about uh, racism in machine learning. I was just wondering if you think it's more a racist world using these and then it spits out racism or if the lack of diversity in tech companies, which I feel like is really well documented, is more responsible for that. Um, and I was looking at your site where it's like when you put into Google autocomplete, you know, black women, da da da, it spits out a, a ton of racist stuff. I remember I put in, I was looking for an op-ed and I was like liberals should and it was like the first one was die, <laughs> kill themselves. I was like, oh my god. I mean, but is that more because like people are searching for that? 
or is it cause most tech companies are <laughs> filled with liberals actually uh, yeah we've got another question further down the spectrum oh thank you um funnily enough my question follows on pretty much from the one at the back is that in the 1980s there was symbolic um uh there were expert systems which were explanatory um as the gentleman at the back has said there is now genetic algorithms but also neur neural networks are not explanatory because they're a mixture of weights, input data, et cetera. Um, so that, opa that opacity, for example, when an insurance, let's say an insurance um, uh, has been refused or a loan has been refused or something, the issues of fairness, the issues of lack of explanatory nature, et cetera. So two questions in that. One that I'll wrap up with the gentleman at the back because I think those, the first question is aligned. Um, and the second question is a more technical question, probably for, mainly for Neil, probably Abiba and Neil, is do you think there's been any progress in explanatory tools for that kind of ML? I mean, I see a few on GitHub and I'm beginning to mess around with things that look like they might be a bit explanatory but we, we'd really badly need that. Okay, so the questions were, genetic algorithms, can we predict the outcome of an algorithm? Uh, is there racism in the world or in the tech companies? So I paraphrase. Um, and then neural networks, are there, is there any progress in the explanatory tools for machine learning? Any tips? So I'm a, on the, the f uh, there's a conference called FAT, uh, which is Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, uh, Transparency in Machine Learning. It's been a big interest of the academic community for a long time, before it became public. Uh, uh, there's been understanding, but it's not generally talked about in the press, but there's a lot of people. There's some really interesting techniques, a lot of which I would characterize as, as sort of meta-learning. If you think about statistics, we're looking at very complex societies. We're trying to summarize them with s sort of simple numbers, which explain what's going on. Well, you can s consider applying that to these complex models that you, you sort of treat the thing as something you don't fully understand, but you can ap apply statistical tools for analysis of what the fairness, the accountability, and transparency is, and that's a very promising area. And uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I think the GDPR is, is driving a lot yeah. of interest I I in that. And, and I think that uh, it's a terrible name, data protection. I, w I prefer to call the gen GDPR good data practice rules, because actually if you can't do the stuff in the GDPR about your data, then you, you probably don't really understand your system very well. And, and who doesn't want to understand their system to improve it? And on the GAs thing, I think we have to be a bit careful with GAs. GAs are just an optimization technique. Um, they don't really reflect evolution because what happily people do is they define a fitness function. And, and in machine learning with a neural net, you'd call it an objective function. As, as you pointed out, neural networks have the same issues of interpretability. The reason GAs don't get you out of this challenge of natural versus artificial systems is that fitness function is mathematically defined, it's unique, and it doesn't change. Whereas in reality, what's our fitness function? How are we going to measure the fitness for people in this room? It's a horrific idea, and it's an idea that led to eugenics, actually. So the reason that natural populations maintain diversity and you don't, the concept of survival of the fittest is a total misnomer that Darwin never even said is because there is no such concept as the fitness because the fitness function is undefined. Diversity is because of the uncertainty in the world and the uncertainty about what we should be doing. And, and that's, uncertainty breeds diversity. And, and the problem with a lot of these techniques is there's no uncertainty in, in the fitness. Um, yeah, the, the question about whether the tech industry is uh, racist or not. Uh, <coughs> I, I think uh, racism has always been around and it's nothing new. Uh, but if your input is racist, your output is going to be racist. If you build your algorithms or your software, whatever, based on uh, historical data, you mm -hmm. embed and you perpetuate already existing racism and sexism. And uh, what's happening now is, uh, <coughs> It, say in the case of before de decision making without algorithms, we have a person making the decision that can be held accountable, that's responsible. Whereas now, because uh, it's algorithms, we have algorithms did it, there is no accountability or accountability and responsibility is diffused. And we have this false or illusion, uh, illustic uh, perception that algorithms are neutral. They are not. If you give them historical data, they embed and perpetuate whatever <coughs> historical problems we have, and they spit that out. Um, yeah, so, so again, on, on the sort of, you know, is the tech industry racist? Um, the question I, was, was the, is the world racist or is 
Is it with the text? And it's just re reflecting that way. The text is the Which one? Yeah. Which one's the biggest devil? So uh, let, let me come back to the, the fun argument we were having before the Q and A started. Um, nobody <laughs> is saying. Neil, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, nobody is saying that diversity like magically fixes algorithms. So that that, that argument's fine. We're all right. Um, equally, I think it's sort of not enough to say that you know just because we have algorithms and they can be games, therefore we couldn't have done a lot more to deal with these problems and head them off in the first place. And when you look at why we didn't head them off, that's where I think the issues around diversity in the tech industry. A real problem. If you take Facebook as an example, Mark Zuckerberg was a 20 something year old kid, white male, rich family, prestigious university, incredibly privileged guy who came up with a philosophy uh, around the idea of radical transparency. And he believed that, you know, if all your data was open, if, if people just knew what you were doing, then all the things that we're embarrassed about that we tend to keep private wouldn't matter so much. And then in this kind of rave new world, you know, you could just put all your information on the internet and it, it wouldn't be so much of a problem. And that's the kind of thing that you can really only believe if you're a privileged 23-year-old white kid from Harvard. Like if you're anyone in almost any other group, you have all kinds of reasons why that's not the case. And so he built this system based on that fundamental principle. And that system has now become the basis of a social network of 2 billion people. And so that's, you know, without necessarily saying X is racist, which I think is a really reductive way of putting it, that lack of understanding of the world that is inherent in a community of people that it's, has such a limited under, you know, view of the world is a major problem. And you see this again and again and again in company after company, most of the, the, the big tech companies. The problems they come up with are things that in a lot of cases other people would have thought of. Um, but they just didn't because they just didn't have that diversity of opinion or background in, in those companies from the start. And, and now we're all violently agreeing with each other. Um, can I ask you a bit about gaming an algorithm as a complete amateur? How do you, can, we, can someone like me game an algorithm? Can I outwit an algorithm? Because I, so I'm trying to book my holiday at the moment and I know that if I go to those online booking systems, if I go in too often, they start to fix the numbers and they overcharge me for my holiday. And I've heard that there was ways about, is there, I mean, that's just an example, but is there a way for someone like me to outwit an algorithm? I think that's why I like the driverless car example. When they put them on the street, then you'll be able to outwit it by walking in front of it. <laughs> that's a and, 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 and you can see that the consequences are genuinely that you won't be able to integrate driverless car traffic with pedestrians. You'll, you'll need... And this is my worry, actually, to be frank, is that the consequences, we become less free because we have to cater for this system that requires us to behave in a certain way. I mean, railways do that, right? And we accept that we don't run on railways. But when that comes into the city centre, what does that mean? But the thing is, you say that, but we already have that with you something, have all with, something with cars. <laughs> no, we have that with cars. <laughs> no, absolutely, but I, like no, we've it's completely true. reconfigured. No, no, it, it, it's absolutely true. I'm not saying that this is anything massively new. We have it again and again. What you see is as the computer needs us to perform for it because it doesn't have this wonderful natural flexibility we have. It can do certain things efficiently and then we have to complete the loop on other things and, and, and d distributing people around city and, and it isn't going to be rich people. It will be a wonderful <laughs> thing because if it exists because everyone will have access to transport and will reduce the number of cars, parked cars on the road if it works. But that requires massive coordination and all sorts of rules about how we're going to treat those roads. Yeah. It's very complex. It doesn't Isn't there an argument for keeping a few private truck drivers in the road so you never know when I'm just to stress it. Crash test dummies. I'm going to get a cheaper holiday, but let's get three more questions in if we can. So there's a question right at the front here. Hi, thank you. Um, on the note of blockchain, one of the applications that's been toted, touted for is its potential to record information for identity building, like psycho and biometrics, social media behavior, and regularity of remittances. Um, so that could mean that dashboards of an individual's information could be used as a standard even for credit worthiness. So I wanted to ask if you see this identity information aggregation as autonomy granting to the individual or deeply problematic in its implications. Uh, hello. Um, I would like to ask Abiba about that um, um, algorithm um, that was used in US, I think. Uh, I think it was called Compass, right? Yeah, yeah. Compass, yeah, yeah. Compass, yeah. Uh, and it's only used in US, right, at the moment? Yeah, and but there the are many more now. 
Yeah, so you see in future some uh, broad use of this kind of uh, algorithms that are basically predicting your sentence and so on. Yeah. And um, like, do you think it's like some morally um, justifiable to use such a kind of softwares? Thank you. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, I want to take the conversation out of the tech industry. Um, and my question is, um, can data be used in some kind of like a more philanthropical way um, for, Hello. for philan philan philanthropy? Philanthropy. Yeah, okay. um, yeah um, um, because there are some conversations on open data and crowdsourcing. And I'm curious to know what you think of that and what the implications are. Okay, so the question about blockchain, whether it grants autonomy whether it has implications, the compass algorithm, and philanthropy, can we use data for philanthropic reasons? Maybe, maybe the, f the first question, whether uh, uh, putting all our, our, act our activities online, making it all open, whether that grants us autonomy and freedom, or whether it's a problem. Uh, I have a feeling you, you, you might disagree, but for me, it's, uh, I see it more as invasion of privacy. Mm. Uh, for uh, they have a, a new uh, system now in uh, China, the, the social credit system, I think, uh, where people are rated uh, who they hang around with or what kind of job they do or what college they went and based on that their social status is established. And I don't think we are far from that here because uh, you like something on Facebook and you see some ads follow later on because of that and uh, you participate in a social, uh, in, in some sort of activism, and uh, you go looking for a job, and you, you worry that because everything you do is out open in the air, because we have become so transparent as a society, because everything we do is that it has a, a digital trace, uh, we are becoming more uh, cautious, more risk-covered, we, we don't express our freedoms because we worry that whatever we do will impact our future, what we do. So I see it as more of uh, invading our, our freedom we, as a lack of uh, the freedom to be forgotten rather than granting us uh, autonomy. Uh, yeah, I think that's totally right. I think that, um, I think that, that my big fear about, I mean, people get very excited about blockchain and data. As Reva said, you know, we value forgetting. Actually, um, you know, the, the thing, you know, the reason I tell my doctor things is because he probably won't bother to remember it. Why does he care? But if, if you've got everything in a blockchain of your entire history, and then this relates to open data as well. Open data is great, uh, but certain data, you know, have, have that characteristic that you lose privacy. I, I mean, I, I kind of have a vague inkling that um, personal data becomes much more important freedom uh, the more you think about it, because it's about control of your self-identity, your virtual identity, and as that encroaches on the real world, that becomes control of yourself in the real world. I think Shaviva mentioned uh, loss of free will, and I think there's really interesting aspects, like if the computer knows you better than you know yourself, and the, and the only control you have against that is, is some sort of ownership of your data uh, within your sphere. Um, I have lots more on that, but I want to let uh, Martin speak. Yeah, I mean, I think the first important thing to say is that if you take that blockchain question, put it on a PowerPoint slide and walk into a VC's <laughs> office, you'll probably walk out with five million pounds. So <laughs> that's, that's worth thinking about. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of blockchain because I, I have yet to actually see a, an application of it that kind of makes any sense and does anything that can't be done by other means, but that's, that's like a whole other thing. I think taking those questions together about sort of data and how it's used, um, again, I think there's the point that we're sort of at the tail end of this long history of people making decisions about us based on data that is held that we do not necessarily have good sight of. Uh, credit reference agencies have been around for donkey's years and significantly affect how much money we can spend, what services we can get access to. Um, go back 150 years and it was people with beards like mine sitting in clubs that were deciding, you know, who could do what and instituting these kinds of hierarchies on society. So. In a way, it's like we're at this transition point into a new set of systems doing the same kind of thing, which I think is what makes it interesting when we're talking about how to um, build those systems. I think as well, you know, there's this kind of social contract that people were willing to give up their data to Facebook 
and were actually quite happy for that to be used for advertising and so on as long as they felt they were getting something good in return and it's when that relationship breaks down when people start to lose faith in Facebook and the other services they're using that they also seem to become a bit more concerned about the data that they have on those platforms. One of the inter minor plug, one of the interesting things mm -hmm. we're trying to do at Fact Matter is, is kind of turn that relationship with data around a bit. So the data that we want to gather from the, the news platform we're building would then be used to actually tackle fake news by you know providing advertisers with ways to avoid bad and malicious content on the internet, which is sort of moving away from this model of you know, oh, we're just going to get masses of data and sell it to something where it's we're going to accumulate data and we're going to actually use that data for some kind of social good. Or, you know, I mean, obviously it makes us money too. We're not philanthropists, um, but it's but it's you know we're doing something and, and you know that, that's actually having a practical um, you know benefit in the real world. And the good, I, the good algorithm to catch the bad algorithm. Yeah, and I th I think we'll see more companies like that in the future. I think there's probably a, a bit of a market there for kind of just as you know we now have alternatives to McDonald's that are like you know buy vegetables and eat salads <laughs> and you know be really healthy I, I wonder if we'll start to see that in the the tech space as well just to start to uh, get back to the compass question uh, uh, should we use algorithms uh, to determine whether someone is likely to commit to recommit crime or not it, I think there are so many questions and so many factors in order to answer that question uh, because uh, for starters, uh, these algorithms are developed by private companies with profit and efficiency in mind. And, uh, they, and in designing those algorithms, they don't usually account for our historical biases and our historical biases carry on to our, our machines, to our algorithms. And um, it also com comes re really comes down to the, to the objective of that algorithm or the objective that society wants to get out of those algorithms. Do, do we want, do we just want to count prison, uh, prisoners numbers or do we want to, do we want our objective to be uh, look into why we have so many crimes, look into how we can improve uh, you know, a certain um, demographics that we are focusing our uh, surveillance on and maybe provide some solution as to uh, how uh, prison uh, numbers can be reduced. Though the private companies that design these sort of algorithms, they, they don't care about that. They don't think about that. They don't question that. They have some intuitions, they gather data, and they use that data to, to prove and to kind of justify their own uh, intuitions and the, their feedback loop goes on and on and on. And if our uh, aims and objectives become to, to serve the, the disadvantaged, to find a solution for a high rate of imprisonment, maybe we would have a better idea of what kind of algorithms we need. I think this is a nice note to end. Neil, I'm going to give you the last word because we've been talking about, I think we picked up that last question about whether the algorithm can be deployed for a social good. Mm. Is, that, is that the future, do you think? Can you see that happening? Oh, it's my passionate belief. I mean, the reason I worry about all these things is I know that the good that these things can do, particularly in health. Um, in health is a sector we haven't talked much about it, but it's one where everything is distilled. The benefits, you know, I've just watched my brother die. And, and so much of this can be stopped with the right information. And, and we must never lose sight of that. Um, a lot of misery can be stopped. I mean, I, I do a lot of work in, uh, um, with Data Science Africa so much good can be done. But if we make errors in terms of the way we're doing these things and laying them down, then you know, we'll lose the, the confidence of, of the public um, and, and we won't be able to deploy these, these wonderful things that we can do. It sounds like we've got ambition. That's a good place for us to end. Can I encourage you, natural intelligence, to uh, join me in thanking our really brilliant...